We invite you now to join Harvest Church as lead pastor Ralph Sigler brings a message of peace, hope, and joy found through Jesus Christ this Christmas. Several scripture passages I want to read to you as we get started this morning. First is out of uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. In verse 5, we read these words. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he might lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Then in James chapter 4, we read these words. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that the spirit he calls to live in us envies intensely? But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says... God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Both of these passages are quoting out of uh, Proverbs chapter 3, I believe, verse 23. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And notice it's very interesting, this passage, both of these, right after he's talking about uh, God resisting the proud and gives grace to the humble, he begins to talk about spiritual warfare. In both of those, he talks about your enemies like a roaring lion seeking who he can devour. Here we read, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Uh, A connection there between pride and humility and spiritual warfare. And then in Matthew chapter 11, we read these words last week and basically we're talking about, mentioned out of this verse that uh, when Jesus calls us, he he doesn't call those who are necessarily uh, faithful, joyful, and triumphant. He calls those who are weary and heavy laden, but he makes us. His intention is to make us uh, faithful, joyful, triumphant. But he also, I also want to mention here what it says to us about the character of Jesus. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want us to pray, but I want us to include in this prayer, uh, as we go into the service, I want us also to pray for people who are really in mourning today because of what happened in Connecticut a couple of days ago, and uh, and I know there's some things right in our own community, Um, you know, people experience tragedy as a part of life, unfortunately, and, and it's harder on everyone, it seems, when it's this time of year. Uh, but especially want us to lift up just um, uh, the people who are grieving and, and trying to work through the terrible thing that took place a couple of days ago. So let's pray. Let's pray together. Lord, we ask for your grace and your strength and your presence to surround these families who are, uh, who are going through the, the grief 
and the hurt uh, and all of the things that they're walking through right now, this tragedy, those who've lost children. Lord, we ask that you would surround them today with your presence. Lord, we ask that you would be pouring out grace, your, your resources. The Bible says, the word says that you have everything we need for all we go through. Lord, that doesn't mean it's easy to go through this, this kind of thing. But it does mean you, you give your people all we need. And we ask that you'd be pouring out grace on these people. Or the word says you're the God of all comfort. We ask that you would give comfort. The door would be open for healing. That you would walk these people, and really everyone affected by this, that, that goes all the way across the nation. You would be walking people through the, through the valley. Uh, Lord, we never want to go through the valley, but we do in this life. Uh, you're, able, you're able to take us through the valley uh, in a healthy way and bring us out on the other side into victory. So, Lord, we pray for your presence in this valley. Lord, we thank you again just for the blessing of coming together as your people, for the blessing of worship, for the blessing of fellowship, for the blessing of your word. And, Lord, we ask that you'd speak to us today and uh, that you'd give us ears to hear and a heart to respond to what you want to say. And uh, we give you all the praise and glory for what you intend to do in, in us, for what you want to do in us during this time together. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, Craig Groeschel talks about taking his four-year-old son to Chuck E. Cheese on his fourth birthday. And uh, they had a good time at Chuck E. Cheese. The only problem was his son was afraid of Chuck E. And uh, so Craig wanted to kind of cure him of that and wanted to show him that Chucky was not dangerous. And so he walks up to Chucky and says, uh, I, I want to show my son that, that he doesn't need to be afraid of you. Play along. And so Craig just kind of lightly slapped Chucky on the face of his costume there. To his surprise, Chucky immediately slapped him back. <laughs> and uh, Craig said, no, no, don't slap me. Just play along. And so he did it again, and Chucky again just immediately slapped him back, and, and he could hear Chucky laughing. I mean, it was all in fun, but, but, but Craig's, <laughs> Craig is saying, you don't, you don't understand. Don't slap me back. And so a third time, he, he uh, I slapped him on the face, and Chucky this time slapped Craig hard, and then backed up and put up his hands, his <laughs> mittens like this, and, and Craig said, you know... Uh, back in the day, I was a black belt in martial arts, and I found myself, without even thinking, just suddenly putting Chucky in a headlock. <laughs> and then he said, I heard a kid in, in the restaurant saying, uh, Mommy, Pastor Craig is whipping Chucky. <laughs> do, do you know anybody who tends to always take the spotlight no matter where you go? Um, <laughs> so, you know, some, most of us know people like that. Whether, whether the event revolves, revolves around them or not, they just always seem to be in the spotlight. That's just their nature. Um, imagine going to a birthday party uh, where all of the guests act like it's their birthday. Sometimes that happens with Christmas, doesn't it? Uh, you know, everybody joins in the festivities, which, which they should, but they kind of forget who the guest of honor is. Uh, it's like uh, two little boys I remember hearing about who were spending the night with their grandparents in December and they knelt down to say their prayers. And the youngest one just at the top of his lungs says, Lord, I pray for a new bicycle. I pray for new action figures. I pray for a new game system. And his bigger brother said, you don't have to shout. God's not deaf. He said, I know, but grandma is. <laughs> You know, giving gifts, I think, is a good thing because it's part of celebrating uh, what God has done. But sometimes it can just kind of be turned in on us. Um, John Weiss uh, points out that when we look at the first Christmas, uh, one of the important things about the context is, is realizing that really for 400 years in Israel... Um, there's, there have been no prophets. Nobody has been, been bringing the word of God. Uh, Malachi, uh, now the Old Testament is not in uh, uh, chronological order, but Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, wa was the latest book written in the Old Testament. 
from Malachi to Matthew, 400 years, and nobody's been speaking in Israel. Um, he, he also makes a point, in his opinion, that there are three great rulers who kind of define that 400-year period. First one, in the 4th century B.C., uh, we have in Greece, Alexander, took the title Alexander Magos, Alexander the Great. From the time he was 5 years old to 16 years old, he was personally tutored by Aristotle. And then over a 13-year period, he conquers the entire known world. Uh, the largest landmass to be under one, uh, one ruler in history at that point, and then dies at the age of 33. Then in the second century, a ruler that comes over the area that we call Israel now, Antiochus Epiphanes, who was very much Greek, wanted, wanted to kind of Hellenize or, or bring the Greek culture into, into, uh, into Israel to the Jewish people. He believed that he was the physical incarnation of the, of the, of the god Zeus. And he robbed the temple treasury, he heavily taxed the Jewish people, and uh, in 167 B.C. he went into the temple and offered up sacrifices to Zeus, who he thought he was the incarnation of. And he offered up in the sacrifices, he offered up pigs, defiling the temple. And then brought the, many of the Jewish leaders together and told them if they didn't join in this worship and renounce their faith, that they would be killed. Uh, we read, I believe it's Josephus who writes about one mother of, of seven sons whose, whose sons were all tortured and killed before her eyes because they wouldn't renounce their faith. And as the sixth son, we read, was being uh, skinned alive, Antiochus says, if you'll just renounce your faith, then not only will I spare your life, but I'll give you great wealth. The historian writes about this mother that she combined womanly affection with manly encouragement as she encouraged her sons to be faithful. And this sixth son, who, who Antiochus said, if you'll just renounce your faith, I'll spare your life and, and give you wealth, re replied to Antiochus, I will be glad to die at your hands. For I will be resurrected to life, but there will be no resurrection for you, Antiochus. During this period, uh, there was a priest um, named Maccabeus, and as a soldier commanded that he offer up sacrifices of, of pigs in the temple, he refused, he killed the soldier, and he and his five sons began a revolt. Uh, really through guerrilla warfare for several years, this this battle went on, and, and, and really probably the greatest battle of this conflict, uh, when it took place, the opposing general came into the battlefield on an elephant. And most of the Jewish men had never seen an elephant before. And from that elephant, he could see the battle, see what was taking place. One of the Jewish uh, insurrectionists, one of the rebels, slipped under the elephant and stabbed the elephant, killing it. Unfortunately, the elephant collapsed on him. And killed him. Uh, but that act of bravery, bravery solidified the rebellion. And after three years of conflict, they drove Antiochus Epiphanes out, out of Jerusalem. Entered into the temple. Uh, as one of the priests came back in, he once again lit the menorah, the seven-candled candlestick. And they called that day Hanukkah. And Jews have always, always celebrated that. Then, in the first century B.C., Julius Caesar had died, and the people in Rome saw a comet appear after his death and believed that the comet had come to carry him off to the afterlife. And so the Roman Senate determined that Julius Caesar was a god. His son, Tiberius, took on the title Augustus, and he was considered the Son of God. He brought all of these rebellions and, and conflicts across Rome to a, to a stop and began what we call the Pax Romana, the, the Peace of Rome, and so he was also called the Prince of Peace. He was considered a savior throughout the Roman Empire, and his actions and his laws were considered good news 
uh, euangelion, which we consider, we, we could translate gospel. In fact, uh, for much of his rule, a herald would go before him and, and, uh, and, and shout gospel, good news. So it's, it's no accident that we get those same kind of descriptions for the real good news, the real Prince of Peace, the real Son of God. The interesting thing is, throughout the reign of all of these powerful people, we talked last week some about Herod. Uh, it was the Roman Senate during this time that, that uh, you know, it was Augustus Caesar that allowed local, local rulers to continue to rule as long as they submitted to Rome and, and submitted taxes to Rome. And so the Roman Senate, Senate gave Herod in, in 40 BC the title King, King of the Jews. And we talked some earlier about him. But in, in all of the reign of, of all of these, these important, powerful people, the word of the Lord never comes. You know, what men think, where, where men think history is really being made is rarely where history is really being made. There's a well-known poem called Ozymandias by Shelley. This goes like this. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculpture well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside that remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. The picture you get from this poem, these, these huge, huge legs with no, the rest of the statue's gone. Part of a face with a sneer. A pedestal. I am Ozymandias, king of kings. Behold my works, you mighty and despair. And there's no works left. Nobody even knows who he is. And I started thinking, I wonder, I wonder how many great and mighty rulers are completely forgotten to history. None of us would know who Herod was, except for his relationship to Jesus. If you live in Israel, you might, because he, he was a great builder. And a lot of the things he built still stand, 2,000 years later. But most of us wouldn't know who he is. The really important things that are going on are rarely the things that we see reported in the news. All of these great people, and yet the word of the Lord doesn't come to any of them. Word of the Lord comes to a peasant girl named Mary. Who, after the Lord has spoken to her very humbly, says, You have been mindful of the humble estate of your servant. Let it be unto me as you've said. The word of the Lord comes to her cousin Elizabeth, who, when Mary comes in the door, and the son that Elizabeth's carrying, John the Baptist, leaps in her womb, and she says, in the old King James and and then handles Messiah, Hail thou who art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And then she, her next sentence she says is, But why should I be so honored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? He speaks to people like Joseph, carpenter, who in response to the word of God, really lays down the one thing we read he was known for, his righteousness. And responding in obedience to God, sacrifices his own reputation. Ends up sacrificing his, his home and his career as the Lord leads them into, uh, into uh, Egypt. He, he comes and speaks to shepherds, kind of on the bottom you know, of, 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 of the standing of society. He comes to shepherds and, and announces the coming of the, of the Christ. He comes, he comes to wise men who were important people, royalty. But these wise men who come, they come to kneel down. They come to worship. You know, worship always involves humbling ourselves. And these wise men come. And then, and then he comes and he speaks, 
he speaks to Jesus' cousin, to John. And so in chapter 3 of Luke, right after we've read the Christmas story, we read these words. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Eturia and Traconitus, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of the Lord came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. And that's in our day, this would be kind of like saying in the fourth year of, of President Obama, in the second year when uh, Robert Bentley was governor of Alabama, in the fourth year of the administration of Mayor Mike Schmitz in Dothan, the word of the Lord uh, came to somebody in this congregation. 400 years, and all of a sudden there's a prophet in Israel. All of a sudden, the Lord begins to speak. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now look at the kind of person here the Lord chooses to be his spokesman. This is someone whose birth was announced by an angel. That can be pretty heady stuff. I don't know anybody here whose birth was announced by an angel. If yours was, I'd like to know about it. And we read in Matthew chapter 3 that all of the people, all of the people of Jerusalem and Judea and the surrounding area went out to him. Um, something we don't often pick up on is there was, there was really a massive revival taking place in Israel before Jesus even showed up. Multitudes of people were going out to John the Baptist. Jesus says in Luke chapter 7, I tell you, those born, among those born of women, which I think is most everybody, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. If there's anybody who had reasons they could have been proud, it was John. But we read about John you're in, 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 in the gospel of John chapter 3 that as multitudes began to go to Jesus to be baptized, instead of John, his disciples kind of saying, Lord, our, our business, uh, John, our business is declining here. Everybody's going after the one you baptized on the other side of the Jordan. And John says, when the friend of the bridegroom uh, watches the wedding, he, he's, he's, not, he's not jealous of what's taking place. It is his joy. His joy to see his friend being united to the bride. He says, that's, that's the joy I have. And then we read those words. He said, I, uh, he must become greater. I must become less. He must increase. I must decrease. There's a, a, several themes that we see going on throughout this whole Christmas story. One is this. At Christmas time, God is speaking. So let me just ask you, are you listening? I want to encourage you to take some time to listen to what God wants to say to you during this Christmas time. And another thing we have is this. God speaks to and works through those who are humble. One of the things God shows us here is that he can work through the smallest. Work through those who seem to be the least significant. John Ortberg's latest book, uh, is entitled, Who is This Man? And he talks about so many of the things that we take for granted in, in, in our day that would not be the way they are if it hadn't been for Jesus. And one of the things he mentions is that this idea of the worth of every person was completely foreign in the ancient world. Uh, again, Aristotle even wrote, it was in the, it's in the nature of things that some should rule and some should be subservient. Slaves in Rome had, in the Roman Empire, had no rights. A master could end their life if they chose to. And so this whole idea of, of everyone having an equality, of everyone having worth, it, it came from Jesus. It came because he says the least, the least are the greatest in the kingdom of God. If you want to be great, be the servant of all. He, he's the one who gave worth to every person. And so we read in, in one of the uh, instruction manuals to the early church, see if I can get this title even right, uh, Didascalia Apostolorum. We read in this in the early church, these instructions that if a wealthy or powerful person comes in in the middle of a church meeting, that the service should not be interrupted. But if, if a poor person comes in in the middle of a service, 
then the bishop presiding should do everything to be sure that he is welcomed, even if it means sitting on the floor and letting that person have his seat. You want to talk about an upside down, (laughs) an upside down kingdom, where in a culture, in a world that had always believed that the powerful were important, And the poor and the simple were just created to serve the powerful. Here you have in the church where the poor are the ones who are honored. Well, you know, Paul got to gave those instructions, didn't he? He said, he said, it's our weaknesses in the body of Christ that deserve the most care. It should be the ones that are most honored, not the ones that already have the honor. Forbes magazine did an article this year on the 70 most powerful people in the world. And the article began uh, with these words, there are 7 billion people on earth, these are the 70 that really matter. That's kind of a demeaning statement right there, isn't it? I don't think any of us are in that list of 70 here. Um, I don't know if anybody in Alabama is in that list of 70. But the criteria they use of this are, are this. One, the number of people who are under their influence. Two, their financial resources Three, if they, influ- if they have influence in one, more than one sphere, in other words, more than one in- in sphere of influence um, where they really have an impact. Four, how actively they wield their power and use their resources. Now, none of the people, none of the people I listed that God spoke to would, be, would, would meet that criteria. There's an old story, and we'll close with this. I've heard for years and years, many of you I'm sure have heard it, heard it before too, but I recently heard it with a little bit more detail. Uh, some of you know, maybe have read about President Teddy Roosevelt, who was president in the early part of the last century, really colorful character. Loved the outdoors, loved to hunt. In fact, he went on several safaris to Africa. Following one of these safaris, he was on a voyage by ship It took two weeks to return home. And because he was on this ship, there were really great parties every night. uh, And everybody's attention was was on the fact that the president, that Teddy Roosevelt, was on the ship. Also on that ship was a missionary who was retiring after 40 years of ministry in Africa. Now, in the early part of the last century, Africa was very wild, very remote. And so when you went away on the mission field like that, there was no email, <laughs> you know, no Skype, no, no, no telephone, letters that took a long time to get back and forth, but very little communication. And after 40 years, he was retiring. He was on this ship, and everywhere he went, he heard people talking about the greatness of the president, the greatness of Roosevelt. And when the ship landed in New York, there were throngs of people there to greet the president, and there were bands playing, and there was a parade. And as the parade moved away from the ship, this missionary slipped off of the boat, almost unnoticed. No one came to meet him. And he said he began to feel kind of sad (laughs) and a little depressed. Lord, after everything I've done, no one, nobody cares. No, nobody's even here to meet me. And said that he got off of the ship and sat down on his suitcase. And found himself saying, Lord, is this how you treat those who are faithful and obedient to you when they come home? And all of a sudden, he said he felt this tremendous contentment wash over him. And this awareness of the presence of God. And he heard God speak to him. He said the Lord said to him, but you're not home yet. And all of a sudden, he was filled with this tremendous joy. You know, when we live for the world, when we live out of our pride, in the end, there's nothing. When we lay it all down, and we take up our mission in Christ. Everything we do stands forever. For more information about a relationship with Jesus Christ, visit harvestdothan.com. Join us Sundays at 845 or 1045 for worship. 
Come discover God's plan for your life.